Hello, I'm Norman Tebbit, and I'd just like to introduce you to this really most interesting film about our European dilemma. It's interesting because it doesn't shout and it's not obsessive. And it sets out the possibilities for the United Kingdom to withdraw from the European Union and its ambition of a single European state. What sort of relationship? Well, of course, it would probably be a relationship very much like that which Norway enjoys as a member of the European Free Trade Area, closely aligned with our friends in Europe, pursuing many common interests together, but not trying to govern each other's countries. It suggests that beyond all the shouting on both sides, there is a harmonious and sensible way forward. Palace of Westminster, seat of our British Parliament, which for 40 years has been surrendering power to the European Union. And there was a reminder of that at the funeral of Baroness Thatcher. Like the assassination of President Kennedy, or the death of Diana, Princess of Wales, or the funeral of Sir Winston Churchill, this is clearly a momentous occasion. This is an occasion where everybody will remember where they were on this day. Beneath the dome of St Paul's, former colleagues gathered to pay their last respects. A small number of the crowd protested, but many others remembered her personal legacy. Half of these people wasn't even born. Yes. Walking out with, it's absolutely disgusting. But, you know, welcome to Britain 2013. If there was a general election tomorrow, then we, I'm speaking for myself personally, I don't know who to vote for because I can't really see a politician that is really standing up for us at the moment, for this country. I mean. The days are gone. I mean, the politicians of this country don't have any power to make any decisions anyway. I mean, it's all done from Europe. Whatever they say, it's all overridden by Europe. They can't do anything. They're stuck. Maggie was the last person to have any any uh, uh, ability to change anything. Uh, completely overwhelmed by Brussels now. I, mean, I think they should give us a vote on whether we can come out of Europe. Well, that's oh, a key yeah. issue, isn't we it? We need to get out of Europe. Europe. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm dead against it. But they won't let us. The frustrated voice of the British people. But what if there was a seismic change in British politics, allowing at least a vote on leaving the EU? Might that be reported like this? The government says it has accepted the overwhelming popular vote to leave the European Union. In a statement from Downing Street, the Prime Minister said he respected the freely expressed will of the people. In accordance with Article 50 of the Lisbon Treaty, the UK government will tomorrow be serving a notice on the Presidents of the European Commission and the EU Council of Ministers in Brussels that the UK will leave the EU in two years' time. Within that timescale, it's expected the country will seek relationships with other trading blocs, particularly the European Free Trade Association. We have, of course, invented this bulletin, but it is possible because of what ministers decided when they met in Portugal in December 2007. The European Union was formed many decades ago and uh, it's comprised of many different um, treaties. The Treaty of Lisbon is perhaps the most interesting because it provides with an exit clause. Welcome to the Geronimos Monastery where ministers approved the treaty and also signed their names in the pavement. With me, Richard North, a leading light in the anti-EU movement, 
explaining the significance of Article 50. Yes, for, for your sceptics, the Lisbon Treaty is the game changer. Yes. It changes yes. everything. Yes. Yes. Uh, for the first time, embodied in the treaty, formally recognised in the treaty, is the right of member states to leave the European Union. This is all mightily helpful for those of us that are Eurosceptics, isn't it? Because we've got a, a pathway, perhaps. Yes, uh, you, you've made the good point. It, it, it doesn't presage or dictate content. It simply sets out a procedure for negotiations. So in this hypothetical situation that we leave the European Union without any thought, it would be absolute chaos, wouldn't it, Sean? Yes, the, 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 the whole of our international relations are tied up with treaties, agreements um, and fundamental uh, joint programmes. And the idea that uh, the sort of British could stand astride the, the, the White Cliffs of Dover and see off the foreigners and tell them what for, tell them that we're leaving, and the foreigners would sort of meekly turn around and say, OK, and come running to us with, with, with agreements for trade and other ideas. It's, Absolute it's fantasy. Everything else that, that goes with 40 years of integration that has to be worked out to the finest detail. And this, presumably... So the Lisbon Treaty signals a clear way out, and our future bulletins may not be so improbable. In talks over the country's future membership of the European Union, the Prime Minister has told Parliament the government will fight for what he calls the best deal for Britain. David Cameron was speaking at Prime Minister's questions following a new poll on the continued membership of the EU. The poll indicates that slightly over 50% of the British people would be likely to vote no in any future referendum, while around 30% would vote in favour, with the rest saying they don't know. The poll is in line with other recent surveys. Our recent research has shown that when asked if respondents would prefer to stay in the EU or leave the EU, it falls out as roughly 50% would prefer to leave the EU and 30% would want to stay in the EU. The rest uh, are not sure what their opinion is. The gap between yes and no voters narrows in the latest result. If the Prime Minister were able to negotiate a more favourable deal for Britain or secure repatriation of powers. From our research in recent weeks, the majority, which is around 58%, have said that they want to see a referendum. The remaining, around 20 to 30%, have said they don't. But the fact is that whenever there is an issue of whether there should be a referendum, the majority of people will say they want to see a referendum and have a choice in what the outcome is, no matter what the actual subject is about. So if there's an exit route, and most people want it, What's happening about a referendum? A question the Bruges Group was asking at this event in Manchester, timed to coincide with the Conservative Party conference in the same city. The Bruges Group is a think tank. We were founded after a speech by Margaret Thatcher, the then Prime Minister. She wanted a, a situation where there wasn't centralisation in Europe. There was uh, there'd be a collection of independent, free trading, and democratic nation states. That's what she wanted, and that's what we're trying to deliver. As Nigel Farage arrived for the meeting, he was besieged by the media, pausing to comment on what he saw as conservative embarrassment about this meeting being held near the conference. Welcome to the Bruges Group 2013. Later, there was a significant moment at the meeting when the UKIP leader, Mr Farage, acknowledged the potential of Article 50 for an orderly exit from the EU. Once we have had a, a referendum on our future membership of the European Union, how do the panel see as the best way out of the EU? Is in fact Article 50 an acceptable route? I have to say, I find the fact Lisbon was pushed through without a referendum that makes it very difficult to accept, but there it is, it's law. So we have to enter into our divorce from the European Union uh, according to the provisions and principles of Article 50, but if we see any shoddy dealing, and if we see Article 50 being used as a means of extracting more from us than we should be giving, uh, then we'll have to just throw the whole thing in the bin. So we need, to, we, we need to enter into this divorce with a spirit of doing it legally and doing it amicably, uh, but the European Union and Brussels itself will need uh, to play fair for the bargain too. 
there's a pathway out of the European Union, and that's to invoke the provisions of Article 50, which is in the Treaty on the European Union. And that gives a, a procedure by which a country can say it wants to withdraw from the EU, and then, of course, negotiations begin and an agreement can be reached. Uh, there's aspects of the treaties which call for the European Union to have free trade relationships with its neighbours, which may well involve the UK joining the European Free Trade Association and thus remaining in the European Economic Area, which guarantees full access to the single market as well. So that's the path that we should follow. And all this brings us back here to Westminster, the home of the UK Parliament, and to the vexed question of whether there should be a referendum on Britain's continued membership of the European Union. Those opposing further EU integration say Britain could rejoin EFTA, the European Free Trade Association comprising of Norway, Iceland, Liechtenstein and Switzerland, which together with the EU member states forms the EEA, the European Economic Area, or as it is better known, the single market. Britain could still remain a member of the, of the single market, which is the European Economic Area, or EEA, which allows for free movement of goods, services, capital and people. And that means that as far as business is concerned, business will trade as they have done before. But the difference will be that regulations will no longer apply to 100% of the UK, but only if you want the 9% which are involved with the export. So again, this will make business life a lot easier and also to help create jobs. Fairly recently, our Prime Minister David Cameron said that if we left the European Union, we would be like Norway, ruled by facts from the European Union. Is that correct? No, I wouldn't say that's correct at all, actually. I mean, Norway do very well by having a lot of influence in the EU as a very prosperous country. People listen to their opinions in the EU. They've developed something called policy shaping, where they're consulted in the process of uh, making new regulations or any regulations in the EU and Norway has 3.5% unemployment, so I would say they're doing the right thing. So when we leave the European Union, what's the reality? What will happen? Operationally, if you have a look at what will change, is that the amount of regulations will fall dramatically. At the moment, Britain gets about 1,000 new regulations a year, and that will drop to about 350 a year. So that's about a 70% cut, 60-70%, which for business is like a tax cut, because regulations are like a tax for them. And you probably notice you don't hear much about Norway in the news, because, well, they're doing fine. The CBI has produced a report examining ways in which two countries, Switzerland and Norway, have formed relationships with the EU without being members of the community. Organisations such as the CBI are saying that our position will be much weaker outside the EU because we simply won't have the clout that we have at the moment. Well, the CBI must be looking at other numbers that, I'm, that the rest of the public aren't looking at because Britain has at the moment about a 40 billion trade deficit with the EU. So it hasn't actually helped uh, the export as being part of the EU. So by removing the EU part of the agreement with the European countries, that regulatory burden, that loss of competitiveness, that taking management time away from managing the business will be removed and Britain will, will be a much more flexible, much more adaptable, much more competitive and will be able to get a trade balance which could mean about a million extra jobs. The small business community, how will they benefit precisely when we leave the European Union? Quite a number of ways. One of them is the, the removal of duplication, because what often happens is that regulations that are made in the EU are actually duplications of existing laws here. So they actually need to do double. They also need to hire people to carry out all these uh, um, the regulations that are needed. Now, large companies, they can use their competitive advantage because they can hire people to do this, which means they squeeze a small business, which means they can actually eliminate competition, which means the consumer is actually at the mercy of just a few companies supplying these services. It sounds as if our news bulletins of the future may be gathering pace. David Cameron this afternoon confirmed his position on the UK's membership of the EU. Speaking at the annual conference of the Federation of Small Businesses, the Prime Minister confirmed it wouldn't be in the interests of business to leave the EU, adding that 50% of our exports go to Europe. Addressing a lively audience of business owners, David Cameron said, quote, because we have a seat at the table in the single market, we help write the rules of the market. The Prime Minister's remarks were met with criticism amongst the delegates, many of whom had voted at their conference 12 years ago to demand that the Federation call for a withdrawal from the European Union. Norway voted twice to stay outside the European Union. How has that turned out? 
Richard North and I went to Oslo to find out. Two beers, please. Our Prime Minister said that if we left the European Union, uh, we could end up like Norway, an absolute disaster. Yeah, I wish you that. <laughs> you don't think you're I a disaster? I wish every country in the world to, to, have, to, to have that bad as we have here in Norway. Good start. Time for a look around. Norway is a booming country. Its five million inhabitants enjoy a great standard of living, which is why the group which led the campaign for independence feels vindicated. Norway has done very well outside the EU, no question about it. We were told back in, in 94 when we had the referendum on, on EU membership that 100,000 jobs would be lost, that business was, would go bankrupt. Today we are a prospering country, so I, I can't see it. We have one of the lowest unemployment rates in Europe, so we're doing quite well outside. We're a small country, yes, in terms of population. I, I wouldn't say we are on the edges of Europe, maybe geographically, but, but, but we, we trade with Europe a lot. Um, we, we still are part of the Council of Europe. Uh, we play a, a, a huge role in, in the UN, for instance. Um, so, so we have influence just not within the EU. I think it's going to be difficult, I really do. But it's not impossible, of course. But, but because Britain has been a member since 1973, um, there are so many links, ties, agreements, what have you. Um, so it will be difficult, but not impossible. I don't think so at all, no. I would I'd rather hope you do it. Norway's fishing industry is flourishing. Its fleets are allowed to catch 40 times more cod in its territorial waters than British boats. Farming too is thriving. Odd Einar Hoytnes represents 5,000 small farmers in his area of Norway, as well as running an organic milk and beef farm himself. We have a, a couple of old Norwegian breeds. They will go to a specific market uh, uh, for um, hotels and restaurants. My family has been running this farm for about 100 years. Uh, my great-grandfather bought this farm uh, from the uh, local uh, man who had it. Right now uh, I do dairy production, uh, organic milk from 22 cows. Well, I think most Norwegians, they think that it's far enough to go to Oslo to talk to the politicians. And they don't want to go all the way to Brussels to try to talk the politicians into common sense. So the main thing about uh, the European Union question was about uh, people deciding on their own future and to have these local politicians still being the ones who are deciding. What do you think would have happened to this farm had the vote gone another way? Well, it certainly wouldn't have been any dairy cows here anymore because the prices has to keep in pace with all the costs uh, that are in the society around us. And um, the Norwegian price level is quite high and if we had the same price development in, in dairy and meat that the European Union has had since '94, uh, I would be in, out of business quite quick, yeah. Well, I think it's a general opinion in Norway that Norwegian agriculture will have big trouble if we had joined the European Union in 1994. And uh, we are a country quite far north, doing much of our agriculture north of the Arctic Circle. And uh, having Brussels governing all this, I think most people realize that will be very difficult. The people of Norway don't want to be a part of the European Union. And right now you see that the, the troubles that the European Union are, are going through is, um, is so deep and so uh, different than what we have in Norway. So you wouldn't get it through in Norway. Well, I think many of the rules, they are not, uh, they are not made in Europe at all. Many of the international rules are made up, up in quite different bodies. Uh, around the world and they are global, not Europe-centered. So I think the future is not looking uh, only on Europe, you have to look all over the world and to make better world for all of us. This is a key point. All regulations in the EU don't originate from Brussels. 
Some are passed down from world bodies, such as the Codex Alimentarius. Richard spoke with the Norwegian chairman of its Fisheries Committee. The, the mandate of Codex work is two, to ensure food safety and fair practices in trade. The Codex works both on regional standards, right. but primarily on global standards. In a formal sense, you're a, a global government, or go, global governance in, in, in that sense, are you not? Yes, we establish trade rules that uh, would be in the benefit of consumers all over the world right. and would also be, as I see it, a benefit for trade operators right. since uh, the other objective is the fair practices in trade. But when our Prime Minister, uh, Mr Cameron, says that when agreeing these standards uh, we need to be at the top table, Codex is the top table, isn't it? Codex is the top table for international standard settings. But I would say that uh, UK has, both in the European Union and in Codex, always presented its views based on science, based on skill, based on historical evidence, and based on a heavy seafood sector. So UK will be heard, both in the European Union and in Codex, when it comes to seafood questions. What's the significance of what we just heard, Richard? The first point that emerges is that Norway is fully involved all the way through the decision process. The second thing that comes over is that the EU is effectively just the middleman. The EU is not creating the standards, it's part of the process, and when it comes down, the EU turns the standard, if you like, into European law, and then the member states, including Britain, implements it. I wonder if such facts will be reported in our future news bulletins. Sources in Downing Street are indicating a decision has been taken on the date for a referendum on Britain's continued membership of the European Union and that it will be announced later today. The Norwegian national broadcaster is NRK, which keeps its finger on the national political pulse. I spoke with one of its leading commentators. But Norway's situation is that the economy is healthy, there are low un unemployment, uh, no uh, debt, national debt, and we have a very, very strong economy because of the oil resources in the North Sea. Why do you think the people of Norway voted not to join the EU 20 or so years ago? The Norwegian people have voted no twice. Uh, twi two referendums we have had and the Norwegian people have said no twice. Uh, the explanations are twofold. One is a very traditionally very strong uh, conflict between the central areas of Norway, the elite and the rural areas, which uh, became very obvious when we debated the EU question and uh, the, the experience that decisions would, be, would move from Oslo and Norway to Brussels was a very strong argument why the Norwegians voted no. So they said, we want to make our own decisions, we don't want Brussels to make them. The others is a strong leftist uh, movement in Norway who are very skeptical uh, towards uh, market liberalism and towards uh, what's happening uh, in the economic uh, sector in the European Union. Norway manages very well outside the EU, uh, financially and economically and uh, politically and uh, in every way. Norway is a healthy country and you can't really say that it would have been better if we were on the inside. Uh, no politician can say that. What some politicians say is that we should have the influence we would have if we were sitting around the table in Brussels. Instead, we're just receiving EU law and regulations by email uh, every week uh, from Brussels. But Norway has influence and, uh, and one of the main reasons for that is, of course, that it's an um, important energy, uh, energy exporter and oil, natural gas, Norway is a big player in that, and when you have control over resources like that, you always have a say. Yes, one of the things that occurs to me is the political self-determination of this country and the maturity of their politics. These people have prospered, these people are doing well, they're happy, they're contented. It's very interesting to see this in action. If you go back to 1972 when you joined the European Union, you were together with Norway and Switzerland and others in another 
trade and negotiating uh, area. And if you consider that again, you have the UK, you have Norway, we have Switzerland, we could also join Iceland and we have a kind of North Atlantic cooperation. But that means that UK cannot think that they should be the boss of this system. They must accept that they are a part of a system with, with equals. And the free trade uh, thinking of English agriculture, which historically has been quite strong, it also has to be revised in such a system. But that would just be wise and that will give rise to a more prosperous and vibrant uh, rural England, I feel. Norway's abundant wildlife and its rich culture and strong business ethos are valued by its people. And the security this brings is recognised at Oslo University, where academics have studied the impact of remaining outside the European Union. We have particularly focused on institutional developments and also constitutional and democratic. Uh, so the kind of, kind of common denominator for all the work here is really about the concern about democracy and, and its uh, preconditions and, uh, uh, if you want, challenges in a, a changing world. It has generated uh, a, lot, uh, a lot of security for business, basically. You, ha you know the operational rules, you may not agree with all of them, but basically it, uh, it renders a high level of predictability to um, productive activity in general. And also, uh, Norway has participated in a lot of the different schemes that the EU has, including, for instance, research schemes and so on, and therefore it has not left us out. We are cooperating on par with other Europeans and we are not suffering from not being a formal member in that sense. For at least one government minister, also a board member of the Norwegian Centre Party, the argument about staying out was won long ago. I was uh, 14 years old, I think, 13, 14, uh, and um, the referendum on the EU membership was coming up in 1994. And um, my, my main argument against membership at that time was that um, it would be a deficit to the Norwegian democracy to move the decision making from local governments, regional governments, and from the Norwegian Storting, the Norwegian Parliament, to Brussels. And of course, uh, ahead of the referendum in '94, there was a big grassroots movement against membership, and uh, we succeeded. We were told uh, of all the catastrophes that Norway would suffer if we did not join the EU. Uh, for instance, we were told that uh, from, from the government, uh, which was pro-membership, that we would lose 50,000 jobs almost overnight. Uh, now, obviously, that has not happened. Well, I think everyone would agree that uh, the Norwegian economy, the Norwegian welfare state is much, much more solid uh, and the private economy in Norway is stronger today than it was at that time. There's absolutely uh, no one in the Norwegian debate that wants to join the EU and, and there is a vast majority in the Norwegian public uh, that does not want EU membership uh, and not only that but they want uh, less integration with the EU. Well, the reason why we joined the EEA agreement was to be part of the internal market which means that we can uh, uh, trade with the EU um, freely there are some exceptions uh, on processed fish, but they are very, very small and, uh, and, and quite minor, I would say. Um, but uh, with the EEA agreement, we have uh, nearly free trade with the EU, and it works very well. Um, in terms of uh, influence or decisions, uh, well, yes, we are not at the table when the voting takes place, but we are able to influence the directives at earlier stages. We have experts uh, working in Brussels, we have dialogue, we, we take part in uh, some of the committee meetings and hearings, um, and we feel we have a very good dialogue with the EU, and we are able to influence directives that are important for Norway. Um, now, um, at the end of the day, when the, when the voting takes place, the situation is like this. Norway has the right to veto. If a directive is not suitable for us, if it is too controversial, we can say no. Uh, while in the EU, the countries are uh, subject to a majority vote. So I would say that uh, we are better off. So where does this all leave us? Richard and I went on a cruise on Oslo Fjord 
to reflect on our visit. It's a fascinating relationship, isn't it? They don't want the EU. Uh, they do have this organisation called EFTA, the European Free Trade Association. Uh, this links them into the single market so that they become part of the EEA, the European uh, Economic Area, and they're actively exploring areas of improvement. So they're ahead of the game, they're thinking ahead and looking to Britain to say, come and join us. The meeting with their minister wasn't that uh, powerful stuff. So different from the Weasley words and the circumventions you get from, from yes. British ministers. You, you had somebody who was very, very clear. We're at the beginning of an adventure, not at the end of an era. One of the things I've noticed is how very much government is not in your face here. Yeah, you could sum it up, they govern themselves, we are governed. I think a lot of people have a curious view that were we to leave the European Union, there would be battleships up and down the English Channel, so to speak, that for some reason or another, on both sides of the Channel, we would be intent on cutting off our noses to spite our faces. The Norway option, membership of the European Free Trade Area, in friendship with our friends on the mainland, is one which is open to us and should be followed. I think there will come a moment when a decision has to be reached to stop all the arguing and talking, to make a decision on whether we should remain as a member of this future European state, or whether we should peaceably withdraw. I think that moment is not yet. I don't think the debate is sufficiently well informed. In the UK, senior political commentators have begun debating the significance of the Norway option and what that means to all of us. This is exactly the kind of thinking which we need to have more of. And you can see that Norway doing unbelievably well. It's much more democratic. It's um, a great country, you know, enviable. Of course, there are, are certain differences with Norway. One is it's much smaller, it's a few, few million people. And secondly, they've got that amazing oil base. So their economy is not nearly as complex or as global as ours. And it is worth making a point that you can't actually just pull out of Europe. You don't. You, you still have a, a relationship, a very complex trading relationship, which will be regulated. The whole exit business is really interesting, and in how it's handled, what are the new arrangements, and one of the things which uh, we all need to do actually ahead of the Yes No campaign is to work out the arguments. Peter Oborn was speaking at the meeting organised by the Bruges Group at which Nigel Farage was challenged by the veteran Tory Eurosceptic MP Bill Cash concerning the Tory marginal seats. That is something worth fighting for. That is the national interest. That is why I say to Nigel, lay off our marginal seats. Don't just try and go for a joint ticket. It won't work. But if you do it, you will then be allies and not our enemies. Thank you very much. But I have to say, Bill, I'm sorry to say this, but listening to you this afternoon, I've realised that you are a hopelessly out-of-date tribal politician who has not recognised that British politics has fundamentally changed. And you ask me... You ask me... To ask me to support a party led by Mr Cameron in order that we can get back our national independence, I'm sorry, you've got to do rather better than that. And finally, into each life, a little rain must fall. But we can all imagine a brighter future when the announcement many long for comes to pass.
The government says it has accepted the overwhelming popular vote to leave the European Union. The Prime Minister is expected to hold an unscheduled meeting with the Queen at Buckingham Palace at 2 o'clock, prior to addressing the House of Commons at 3.30.